Hi, I'm Tom, coming to you from the Don't Screw It Up workshop and world headquarters of Cleveland, Ohio, where we solve the most complicated problems on earth. In today's video, I'm going to tell you everything you ever wanted to know about the Holy Stone HS120D drone. When I say everything, I mean everything. Now, before you panic when you look at the length of this video, this you might think is a long video. It's actually 20 short videos jammed into one. I'm going to go through every single feature of this drone and I'm going to explain it and demonstrate it. There is nothing like this on the internet. If you were trying to find all the answers to these questions, you'd be searching through a thousand videos, watching a hundred ads, wasting a lot of time. I put everything in one place. I have chapters at the bottom of the screen. You can scroll across there and pick the chapters that are interesting to you, or you can just watch the whole thing because this is jam packed with one of a kind information you're not gonna find anywhere else. So the reason I'm making this video is because this is my first drone. I've been talking about getting a drone for years. I finally saved up the money and pulled the trigger. This is my first one. And in the first six days of flying this, I crashed it every day. Crashed into a tree three days, crashed it into my garage door one day. I could not figure out how to fly this thing. And I'm the type of guy who reads the manuals. I watch the instructional videos on YouTube. I follow all the rules. I was really struggling with this thing. And I realized if you're a beginning drone flyer or a first time drone owner, these things are complicated to figure out. So I'm gonna teach you everything that I learned as I finally figured out how to fly this thing I'm not gonna pretend it's simple. I'm not gonna make a four minute video that says learn to fly a drone in four minutes because it's more complicated than that. So if you really wanna learn how this thing actually works and how to fly a drone without crashing it into your garage, without landing it in a tree, and without having to explain to your spouse why you just spent $150 and you lost your drone on the first day, watch this video. Now the first order of business here in the Don't Screw It Up workshop is safety. These drones can be dangerous. The spinning propellers are sharp like little samurai swords. You don't wanna go out to fly your drone and come home looking like Al Pacino and Scarface. So I always wear safety glasses. I wear a hat, I wear long sleeves. Keep your hands away from the propellers. That thing will make a julienne salad of your fingers. Always read the manufacturer's instructions and follow the safety guidelines in the manual and the safety guidelines in your local municipality. Flying a drone is risky business. Every time you take it out, you're taking some risk. Now I'm gonna do my best in this video to share with you what I believe to be true and accurate information, but the manual's not very good. I'm not affiliated with the company, I'm not a professional drone flyer. I'm just a guy who's interested in sharing with you what I know about this drone that I've had for a couple of weeks. Now I've done a lot of research here and I think that this can help you reduce your risk, but there's no way I can guarantee that and there's no way that you can ever fly a drone risk-free, so be careful and do it at your own risk. I bought this model HS120D on Amazon for about $150. I am not affiliated with the manufacturer in any way. Let me show you what's in the box. So you've got the drone, you've got the controller or transmitter, you got two batteries with a charger, you got a box of spare propellers and propeller parts, and you got some extra landing gear. It also comes with this nice backpack, which has this molded storage inside there that's actually pretty nice. And last but not least, it comes with one of the worst user manuals I've ever read in my life. I'll talk more about this a little bit later. The two things you need to buy with this configuration is you need a memory card. This one does not come with a memory card. It takes a micro SD card. I bought one of these for about $10. I got a 32 gigabyte card. There's confusing documentation of what's the maximum memory card you can put in this drone. The manual says it'll take 128 gigabyte card. People online says they can't get that to work and it only works with a 32 gigabyte card. I don't know the answer to that, so I bought 32, it works great. This gives me about nine hours of recording time on a video. In addition to that, you get these USB charging wires with the transmitter and with the battery charger, but you don't. it doesn't come with the plug. I buy one of these plugs that has the two USB adapter in the back, so I can just plug both of these things in here and I can get these into one 
outlet. There you go. That's a piece of work right there. Now, some configurations of this drone come with a memory card. It'll typically be in this little bag of parts if it comes with one. You can also look in the back of the drone. It's possible it could be loaded in here. I had an empty slot in the back of mine and nothing in the package. I had to go buy one. There are three components to the assembly of this operation, the drone, the controller, and the app, which is gonna go on your phone. Let's talk about each one of these three in detail. First, the drone. This was fully assembled out of the box like this when I got it. Sometimes you have to assemble this, follow the instructions in the manual. If you need to assemble the propellers, the landing gear, or attach the camera, those are instructions you'll find in the book. What are the components here? Four propellers on the top, hooked on the four brushed motors. There are four lights on these corners. The lights turn different colors. You have the landing gear on the bottom. That's a replaceable part in case you break those. You have your camera, which is a one axis gimbal. It'll move up and down from zero degrees, which is horizontal, to 75 degrees, which is almost straight down. Straight down would be 90, 75 is a little bit up like that. And you have the battery compartment here in the back. This one came with two batteries. You wanna look for the thing that says up, put that side up, snap the battery in, that's how you put it in. And then you have the SD card in here. You just press that SD card in, that's your memory card. You'll hear it click, it'll stay in place. You click it again, it comes out. That's how you get that thing out. Now the battery actually snaps in here pretty hard, especially when it's brand new. You gotta squeeze down pretty hard to get that battery to come out. So be careful when you're grabbing the drone. You don't wanna grab it too hard. You don't wanna grab the propellers but you gotta get a firm grip on that battery to squeeze down on it to get it out. Now this drone is below the, the, the weight that requires this to be registered with the FAA, at least in the US, follow your local regulations, but this is considered to be a lightweight drone. I believe this is 220 or 230 grams, which is less than a pound. Next up, you have the controller or the transmitter. This goes by two different names. I'm gonna generally refer to this as the controller. It has these two antenna on it that you flip up like this. It has two handles on the bottom that you pull out like this. It has a phone holder that you flip up like that. Your phone will snap into this phone holder, but there's not a very big lip here on the bottom. So be careful because my phone likes to flip out of there. It's just not a very good design there for catching the edge of the phone. Now I'll go through the function of these controls later in the video, but just so you're aware of what's on here, you have the two joysticks left and right. The left joystick gives you your altitude up and down. And when you push that left and right, that'll rotate the drone on axis left and right. The right joystick forward and back goes forward and backward. Right, it'll fly right, left, it'll fly left. Then there are four buttons on the top here that you need to know about. The first one in the upper left, that's called the headless mode button. It looks like little compass points. That controls the mode that you're operating in. There are three modes. GPS mode, which is the standard default mode. Headless mode, which I'll talk about in more detail. And if you hold that button down for three seconds, it puts it into something called altitude mode, which turns off all the GPS. That's a bad thing. I don't recommend doing that. Moving down to this button on the left side, Near the bottom, this is the return to home button. If you press this button and you're operating in GPS or headless mode, the drone will fly back and land exactly where you took it off from. That is a phenomenal feature. Moving over to the right side. Now I have the power button. You click once to turn it on. And this has a little bit of a peculiar way to turn it off. You do kind of a double click. You click it once and then click it a second time and hold it. And then it'll turn off once, then off. And then in the upper right here, you have the auto takeoff and auto landing. That's a feature that I will demonstrate. So now there are four other somewhat hidden controls on the front of this controller. On my left side, I have the photo button. If I click this, it takes a still photo. Below that, I have the speed control button. Very, very important. This is a little wheel that will change the speed from slow to medium and to fast. And then on the right, I have the video button. I click this and I'll start shooting video. And underneath that, I have my camera angle adjuster. When I move that wheel, that camera goes up and down like this on that one axis gimbal. Those are the controls.
And then in the middle of the controller, there are these four indicator lights. These are extremely important to understand. Many times when people crash their drone, it's because they don't know what mode they're operating in and they don't know how the controls are operating. These four little lights tell you a lot of information about how your drone is operating. And these are very difficult to decipher and the manual is not very clear on what these four lights mean. So I'm gonna explain those in more detail. The first indicator is the return to home indicator. This indicator light will be lit when you're operating in the default GPS mode or when you're operating in headless mode. That means return to home is enabled. If you press that return to home button, the drone will fly back from exactly where it is at that point in a straight line without avoiding any obstructions, but it will land on the target where you initially took off with that return to home button under either of those two modes, GPS or headless mode. There's a third mode when you click that compass button up there in the upper left-hand corner called altitude mode. Altitude mode shuts down all the GPS capabilities. This light will turn off. If that light is off, you are on your own. You have no leash on your drone. You are completely in control of your drone with these two joysticks. There's no other controls available. So when that light is off, you are in the danger zone because your drone has no idea where it is. The second indicator light is the speed indicator. It has three settings. When it's off, that means it's slow. When it's lit, that means you're in medium speed. And when it's blinking, you're in fast speed. The default is medium. So if you're a beginning flyer, and you just turn this thing on, it's gonna to go to medium, which is actually kind of fast. So what I recommend, if you're a beginner, every time you start this thing up, click that wheel on the left-hand side and get this thing back into slow mode. You should always start out as a, as a beginner in slow, even though it's gonna to default to medium. The third indicator light is the camera indicator. This light always seems to be on. It just means the camera is ready, whether the camera is even ready or not. I don't even have this hooked up to the drone and it says the camera's ready, but that light always seems to be on. And then when you take a still photo, you click the still photo button, this will blink and beep twice, beep, 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 like that. When you're taking video and you click this button on the controller, this will beep continuously as long as you are recording. This drives a lot of people crazy. There's a way to avoid this. There's another way to record video without that beeping going on. I'll talk about that later in this video in the section where I talk about photo and video. The fourth indicator light is the headless mode indicator. When you first fire up the controller, that what light will be off. It means you're not operating in headless mode. You're operating in what I call full GPS mode, kind of the normal operating mode. So the default is that that light will be off. So unlike the other three lights, which generally are gonna be on when you boot up the drone, this one's gonna be off and that's okay because that means you're using full GPS capability. When you click the headless button to put it into headless mode, that light will turn on, it will turn blue. So that means that you are in headless mode when that light is on. And then if I hold down this headless button for three seconds and I put this into altitude mode, that's where it shuts down headless mode, shuts down GPS mode, you're flying freestyle that light will go off and the return to home indicator will go off. That's the only way to know that you're in altitude mode, which is a little bit crazy because that's a really dangerous way to be operating your drone. And the blue light on the right looks exactly the same as when you're operating in full GPS mode. Whoever designed this is trying to drive you crazy. The only way to know you're in altitude mode is if that headless indicator is off and the return to home indicator is off. You'll also see on the app, that on the bottom of the screen, there's a little status bar. And when you switch into that mode, it'll briefly say altitude mode if you happen to be looking at your screen for a fraction of a second. This stuff's all super confusing, really complicated user interface here. So I've created this table so you can come back and look at this in the future because I know you won't remember half of what I just said. But some of these lights are on in the default mode. Sometimes they're off in the default mode. Sometimes when it's on, that's kind of good. Other times when it's on, that's bad. It's just very confusing. So I listed out here all the modes of all the lights.
And then the third part of the controls here, you have the drone, you have the controller, you have the app. The app is gonna be on your phone. You wanna download this, it's called HS GPS V1. That's the app for this drone. On the home screen, you're gonna to wanna to select the model HS120D. Underneath that, you're gonna see the application version. And then when you connect your drone to Wi-Fi using your phone, you'll see the firmware number of the, the drone software. And I'll go through that again when we talk about the whole boot up procedure. But you'll oftentimes wanna to go to this home screen to see if the Wi-Fi is actually connected to your drone. Then there are five buttons across the bottom here. Let me go through these. This is a piece of work too, let me tell you. Quick start, this doesn't actually start anything. It's basically just a picture that shows you all the components that are on the screen, which I'm gonna talk through anyways. But that tells you what all is on the app. The control button takes you to the main screen where you can control and fly the drone using the first person view, which I'll come back and describe what that means. And there's a lot of buttons on here, some of which do the exact same thing as buttons on the, the controller. Some of them do different things than the same button on the controller. And some of them are only available on the app, clear as mud, that's why I'm going through this. Let's come back and discuss the controls in a little bit more detail. Let me just continue going through the high level first. Learn to fly, you click that, it gives you the option to click on a video that takes you to a Holy Stone advertisement that actually doesn't show you how to learn to fly. There's really no use to that. Photos and videos takes you to the gallery of photos and videos that are stored on your phone. So these are, are photos and videos that you took using the controller. It's gonna store those on your phone and you'll be able to see them here and you'll be able to see them in your phone library. As far as I can tell, what appears here in this media gallery is exactly the same as the photos and videos that are showing up in my phone library. So this is just another way to access your phone photos and videos that were taken by the drone. Now there's one important footnote here and I'm gonna go through this in great detail later. The, your, your drone is also storing video and photos on the SD card on the drone. These do not appear on your phone. They only are on that card. It's incredibly confusing and I'm gonna talk about that later. The next button on the homepage is support. And what you see here is the website. If you wanna to go to the website or the Facebook group, I found those both to be generally unuseful. And then the, the last button on here is the upper right-hand corner. You see this little chat symbol. If you click on that, this will take you to the Holy Stone support site where you can do live chat. Now let's go back to that control screen because this is really where the action happens. Let me go through each one of these icons on here individually and tell you what it does. The upper left hand corner you have a back arrow that takes you back to the home screen. The next button over is the controller button that opens up more controls on this screen. So that, that button you should be thinking of not as the controller but as more controls. So I'm just going to close that one for now. I'm going to come back to that one. The third icon over is the map. This is called Tap Fly. This is a feature where you can click on one or multiple points on the map and the drone will actually fly to those points. I'm gonna demonstrate this later in the video when we get to the section called Tap Fly. The fourth tab over is called Photos and Videos. That's exactly the same as clicking Photos and Videos from the homepage, nothing new there. The fifth icon over is your flight record. The flight record shows the date, the distance, the speed, and the altitude. I believe that distance is the total distance. I believe the speed is the average speed, and I believe the altitude is the average altitude. There's no documentation to confirm that. The next icon over, the VR goggles. This would allow you to use virtual reality goggles with this uh, drone. I have not tried that, so I can't comment on it. And then that seventh icon over there, that little rotating symbol, that will flip the screen 180 degrees. This is one of the dumbest features I've ever seen because if you click that, you would think it would let you flip your phone over. All it does is it flips the camera image 180 degrees, but all the buttons on the screen are still upside down. So unless you're flying your drone upside down, I don't really know what the purpose of that button is. I wouldn't recommend it. The little satellite dish there, is your GPS 
signal indicator. You always want to make sure that you have a GPS signal when you're flying in GPS mode. The last icon in the upper right hand corner, that little gear, you click on that, that opens the settings. This is incredibly important to understand. I'm going to go through this in a lot more detail later in this video when we talk about beginner mode and super beginner mode. And the last item on here, the return altitude, I'm going to talk about when we talk about the return to home feature. But you just should be aware of what's in here because you're going to want to look at this before every time you fly. You can set your maximum flight distance, which is how far away do you want the drone to fly from the takeoff point. It'll create an invisible barrier. It's like putting your drone on a leash. If I put 30 meters in there, it'll stop when it gets 30 meters away from me in any direction. So it's a 30 meter radius around the takeoff point. And then the flight altitude obviously is the highest height that you want to fly to. I'm going to cover these in a little bit more detail when we go through that section, but just be aware that's what's in there. Now let's click on this extra controls button to see what we have. And now on the left, I see this little running man. If I click on that, two sub icons open. This is the follow me feature of the app. These are two features that are not available on the controller. The only way to activate these is on the app. The first one is called follow me, and that's where it's, I would think of this as moving follow me, which means when you click that button on the app, the drone will keep the camera pointed towards you and the, and the equidistant away from where you are. And if you walk around your yard, the drone's gonna follow along with you. And then the second one is called lock follow me. And that's where the drone will remain locked in a hover position. You draw a little square on, on the screen of what object you want the drone to follow, like yourself. And if you start walking around your yard or wherever you are flying your drone, the drone will stay locked in its current position, but it'll always keep the camera focused on you. That's kind of like moving selfie mode, if you want to think of it that way. I'm going to go through this in detail and demonstrate this later in the video. Going down the left, return to home button on the app does exactly the same thing as the return to home button on the controller. I'm not sure why that's on the app. The next button down is auto takeoff. That does the exact same thing as the auto takeoff button on the controller. I'm not sure why we need that on the app. And you have auto land. That does the exact same thing as the auto land button on the controller. Not sure why we need that. Those three do the exact same thing. Moving over to the right and the top, you see this little picture of a hand going like this. This is called gesture control. And theoretically, if you go like this, the, the drone will take a photo. And if you go like this, the drone will take a video. I can't get that feature to work. I don't think that feature actually works on this model. If it does, I'd love for somebody to post a video of that in the comments, because I've tried this a hundred times and I look like kind of a crazy guy waving at my drone and doing the peace sign on my drone. I can't get it to do anything, but it's supposed to activate the photo or video. Next one down is the camera button. If you click the camera button on the phone, it's the exact same thing as clicking the camera button on the controller. The video button is the next one down. If you click that video button on the app, that does something different than when you click the video button on the controller. And it's very important because some people return their drone over this. If you click the video button on your controller, you'll hear that constant beeping noise while the, the video is recording. If you click the video recorder on the app, it will do the exact same thing. It'll record video, but it does not beep. So when people say, how can I stop that incessant beeping? Click the video camera on the app instead of on the controller and it won't beep and it will record the exact same video on your phone and on the drone. There is tremendous misinformation, confusion, disinformation, mistakes, omissions, and errors about this, about if I click it on the app, it only records on my phone. If I click it on the controller, it only records on the drone. None of that is true. This does the exact same thing as clicking the video button on the controller. It just doesn't beep. I've tested this a hundred times and I'll go through that in more detail later. Lastly, you have the microphone button. When you click the microphone button, you can click this on at any time. It just doesn't do anything unless you're recording video. So when I click that microphone button, that just means my microphone is turned on, but it's not recording. As soon as I click the video button, either on the app or on the controller, it will enable the microphone on your phone. And if you start talking, you'll hear yourself talking on the recorded video. However, 
There are two copies of the video that are stored when you record. I'll go through this in detail. Low resolution video is stored on your phone. High resolution video is stored on the SD card on the drone. There's no audio ever stored on the drone. There's no microphone on the drone. And when you're talking into the microphone on your phone, that audio never makes it to the drone. So you'll never get audio when you take that SD card out. That is always silent movie. Going down to the lower right, you'll see the battery power indicator for the drone and the battery power indicator for the controller. The power indicator for the drone will start to blink red and it'll say low battery in the lower left when it starts to get low. There's a lot of low battery features I'll talk about and demonstrate those later. And low battery on the controller is when your controller starts to run low. The controller battery lasts a lot longer than the drone battery. I haven't ever run this down, so I don't know what the capacity is, but you don't have to worry as much about losing your controller battery. If you do, the drone will automatically return to home if it senses that the controller battery is dead. Next, across the bottom, those very small series of letters and numbers, this is important to understand as well. The first one, D, is the distance from the takeoff point in meters. H is the altitude from the takeoff point in meters. DS is the horizontal speed of the drone moving like this. VS is the vertical speed of the drone. Those are both shown in meters per second. And then the lower left-hand corner, finally, on the app is called the message bar or the status bar. You'll see a number of different messages popping up here. I'll go through those as they come up later in the video. So as I mentioned, this is my first drone. When I was reading the manual and trying to understand this thing, there were a lot of terms that I didn't understand what they meant. FPV, GPS mode, headless mode, altitude mode, very confusing. And the manual certainly didn't help very much. So I'm gonna explain for the beginning drone pilots out there what these terms mean and a way to think about them so it's easier to understand how to fly the drone. If you're an experienced drone flyer, you can skip past this section. You probably know all this stuff. So the first thing, FPV, first person view. This is a term that's used with drone flying and I'm like, who's the first person? Like I thought I was the first person. Is there another person present? If there is, I don't know where they are. First person view means imagine that you're riding on top of the camera. Imagine that there is a cockpit in the drone and it impacts two things. When you look at what's on the screen of the app, that is looking always from the viewpoint of the camera. That's the first person view means the camera view. And the second thing is that the controls in standard GPS mode operate relative to first person view, which means you're riding on top of the camera when you're flying the drone. You're not standing in your yard looking up at it. You're sitting on top of it. That's what first person view is. When you're flying a drone, you got to get your head around that to understand how the controls are working. Just to illustrate this more vividly, when it says first person view, that means you're riding on the camera. So imagine this garbage can is a camera. First person view means I'm riding the camera. And when I am controlling the drone, I'm always controlling it relative to the direction that the camera is pointing. So when I say you're riding the camera, that's just like Slim Pickens did in Dr. Strangelove. That's for the older folks. For the young people, that would be Rockhound in Armageddon. Please get off of the nuclear warhead. You know what I'm talking about. That's what first person view means is that you're always seeing on the screen what the camera is seeing and the controls are always operating relative to the position of the camera, not the position of the drone. It goes like this. You got to think of it like that. Now to demonstrate how this works, I'm going to need the help of my little drone pilot friend here and his landing pad. Here's the landing pad. Here's my drone pilot. Here's how first person view works. You always orient yourself away from the camera. So he's pointing this way, the camera's pointing this way. When you take off, when you push that right joystick forward, the drone goes forward. When you pull it down, it goes back. When you move it to the right, it goes right. When you move it to the left, it goes left. That all makes perfect sense. Just like driving a car, turn the steering wheel to the right, it goes to the right. What happens though is I can rotate the drone now this way 
So now my camera is pointing back towards the pilot. If I'm actually sitting on top of the drone and flying, now the controls are oriented in the direction of the camera. So when he moves the right joystick forward, instead of going this way, now it's going toward him. When he moves the right joystick down, it goes back. It's the total opposite of when it was flying the other way. When he moves the joystick to the right, the drone goes to the left. And when he moves the joystick to the left, the drone goes to the right. This is mind boggling. I mean, that's really confusing. But that's how drone flying works is you have to always put yourself in the orientation of the camera. Now, another way to think about how this first person view works is that when you get ready to take off the drone, the camera's always pointed this way and you're behind the camera. You're behind the drone looking in the same axis as the camera. When you're flying the drone, it's almost like the drone puts a stick on your head. So when the drone turns this way, your controls are as if you're flying behind the drone up here in space. The drone turns this way, you're working the controls as if you're up here. So when you move the joystick right, you and the drone move to the right. When it's going left, it goes to the left. Now, if you remember the first time you take this thing off, when the drone is facing the opposite way and it's coming back at you and you move the joystick right and all of a sudden the drone goes left, you're like, what the heck is going on here? It's not, it's because you're not down here. The drone doesn't think of you down there. The drone has moved you up here. So when you're flying this thing, you move left, the drone moves left. It's always as if your perspective is that you're always flying behind the drone. Now, luckily on the app, you're always seeing what the camera is seeing. So if you're outside flying in a wide open field where you have zero risk of hitting anything, you can just be looking down at your phone and flying this thing. And it really doesn't matter where the drone is because you know you're not gonna run into anything. But if you're flying it like you are in my yard where I have trees, I got electrical lines, I got a house, I got a garage, I can't be looking down at my phone because I don't have time to react. So I need to learn to fly the drone backwards when it's coming towards me and forward when it's going this way. So your brain has to do that mirror image. So this is how drones operate, but then people are like, this is really kind of confusing because I just want to take like selfies of myself with the drone. And when I go right, I want it to go right. And when I go left, I want it to go left. So then the drone manufacturers came out with something called headless mode. Headless mode means the head of the drone where the camera is doesn't really matter when you're in headless mode. It's always relative to the original position where you took off. So if the, if the operator is standing here and he's aligned with the drone this way, when you fly in headless mode and you go forward, it's going to go this way. But then when you turn it this way, headless mode ignores the position of the camera. So the controls and the right hand joystick keep operating the same way. So now I pull it down, it's going to come back to me. I move it to the right, it's going to fly to the right. I move it to the left, it's going to fly to the left. That's totally different than, when it, than if it was in standard GPS mode where it operates in that mirror image. So headless mode is just a different way to operate where you don't have to worry about the position of the camera. You're really just flying the position of the drone around and you can be rotating this thing on a 360 degree axis like this. Wow, that's pretty cool. You can make some crazy videos doing that. And the controls will keep operating that smoothly because it doesn't matter what direction the camera is facing. The only thing to be aware of is that that only maintains the position relative to the original takeoff position. So when I take off this way, I made this mistake because I like to wander around my yard when I'm flying my drone. So I take this thing off, I've pushed the, the right joystick forward and it goes forward. I push it to the right, it goes to the right. But then I like walk around here because I want to see what's going on and get a different vantage point. Now, when I push the joystick to the right, it doesn't go this way because it doesn't care where I am. It doesn't care where I am. It only cares what the original position was when I took off. So every time I move the stick to the right, it's always going to go to the right relative to the takeoff point not relative to me. So the bottom line, the easy way to think about headless mode is plant your feet and do not move and the controls work perfectly.
If you start walking around, you start turning, you start doing this, the drone doesn't know what direction you're facing. It always thinks you're facing forward in the position where it took off. And then the last flying mode is called altitude mode. Again, that name doesn't really mean anything to me. Altitude mode means I'm shutting off all the GPS capabilities of my drone. It basically says that there are thousands of GPS satellites up in space that the government flew up there for the military and we can use them for free, but I don't wanna use them. I just wanna shut everything down. Anything that's gonna control me from flying my drone into a car, flying it into a tree, flying it too far away where I'm gonna lose my Wi-Fi signal. I don't want any of that stuff. I'm just gonna fly this thing freestyle like I'm flying a drone 15 years ago before they had GPS. And I just wanna control this thing because I'm so good at controlling the joysticks. I don't need any other controls. Just let me fly it freestyle. Altitude mode means turn everything off except a barometer in the drone so it does know how high it is off the ground, but otherwise you got no controls. Now, if you're flying the drone indoors, which I do not recommend, well, let me say it this way. If you're flying the drone indoors, you absolutely need to have the propeller guards on here. That's a accessory you can buy. I did not get those with this configuration, but if you wanna fly it indoors, get the propeller guards. My second recommendation is don't fly your drone indoors. If you fly this thing indoors, you're gonna crash into stuff, you're gonna break stuff. If they had drones around back during the Brady Bunch, instead of bouncing that ball down the steps and breaking Mrs. Brady's vase, it would have been a drone and they would have said, mom always said, don't fly drones in the house because you're gonna break stuff if you do that, so don't do it. Altitude mode, it's not for beginners. I don't even know if it's for like sane people why you would fly with all the GPS capabilities turned off. That's what altitude mode is. Now the next thing we need to understand is the flight envelope. This is not just for beginners, this is even for advanced flyers. And if you really understand the flight envelope, this will dramatically reduce your probability of crashing or losing your drone. This is not described in the manual in any meaningful way, and you don't typically hear people talking about it, but this is the tool that you use to keep from losing your drone. The flight envelope is basically three variables. It's the speed of your drone, it's the distance that you want it to fly from the takeoff point, and it's the maximum allowable height of your drone. So as I say this, you're thinking, oh, that sounds familiar. That sounds like that settings menu in the app. You are correct. Let's go there. So in my app, I go to the settings menu and it has this beginner mode turned on, which defaults it to 30 meters of distance. That's distance from the takeoff point in all directions. So it's 60 meters this way and 60 meters that way. That's a big space. And it's 30 meters of height. That's almost hundred feet. If you're in the US, that's pretty high. I'm not gonna talk about the return altitude because that's not part of the flight envelope. Let's just talk about distance and the altitude as the maximum of this perimeter. And then the third dimension is speed. So inside this envelope that I'm setting up, which is my distance and my altitude, I also wanna control the speed. When you turn on the, the drone and the controller, it's gonna to default to medium speed. That's the blue light indicator on the little speedometer on the controller. Medium speed is pretty darn fast if you are a new flyer. So my recommendation is as a beginning drone flyer, Every time you boot this thing up, as soon as you turn this controller on, turn the speed to slow. There's no reason you should be learning to fly a drone at anything faster than the slowest speed possible. Set it to slow. So we have the three components of the flight envelope, distance, height, speed. Now let's talk about what that looks like. So when we think about the flight envelope, basically what you're doing is you're creating a cylinder around the takeoff point it's gonna become like a force field that your drone cannot fly through. This is an incredibly useful feature for new drone flyers, and a lot of people don't take advantage of this or know anything about it. So the way I think of it is like this hula hoop, you know, for kids. And let's say the distance of this hula hoop from the takeoff point to the edge is 30 meters. This is what it would default to 
in beginner mode. So basically I'm creating a perimeter that says this is the maximum distance that I want the drone to fly. And this perimeter is then gonna go up to the altitude that I set it to. Let's say this is 30 meters high. I've created this force field. It's an invisible cylinder, just like this, just like on Star Trek, goes up and down like this. The drone will not fly through this. It's incredible. So if your neighbor's house is right here and you set your flight envelope to be shorter than the distance from your takeoff point to your neighbor's house, it's impossible to run into your neighbor's house. If you have a giant tree in your backyard and it's just outside of this flight envelope, that's cool because you'll never fly into that tree because when you fly inside the envelope, as soon as you hit the edge, the drone will bank like this and come back about 10 feet and then let you control it again. You can't go through this. It's like a force field. You try to go up, up, up. I'm pushing the left joystick up as hard as possible. It just hits the maximum height. It won't go any higher. I get real frustrated because I want to go higher. Oh, I set the maximum height. It's stopping me. I try to go this way. Boom, hits that, goes back to the middle. Try to go this way. Boom, comes back this way, goes to the middle. The flight envelope helps you stop from crashing your drone. Now, it's important to understand when you set up the flight envelope in this example, 30 meters, it's not 30 meters from you or where you're standing. It's 30 meters from where the drone takes off from the takeoff point. That's why I put this hoop around the takeoff point, not around this guy. That's not the flight envelope. This isn't the flight envelope. This is the flight envelope. It's basically 30 meters from the takeoff point. So why is this important? Because I like to walk around when I'm flying my drone. So I take it up, I'm flying it around, everything's cool. I start walking, I start walking, I start walking. I'm still maintaining the same distance. Boom, all of a sudden, my drone starts going crazy up here and I'm like, what's the problem, what's the problem? I start overcorrecting and it starts going crazy because I'm standing right next to the flight envelope trying to go through the invisible force field and the drone's saying, you can't go here. So it has nothing to do with me. Get that guy back out here. It has to do with the starting point. And then lastly, you're probably saying, I never heard anything about this flight envelope. What is this all about? You can actually see your flight envelope. They don't tell you this, but it's right in here. If you click on the tap fly icon, that's the little map indicator on the app. It pulls up a picture of the map. It shows a blue dot. And if you zoom in on that dot, it will show you a red circle around that dot that is actually your current flight envelope. It's based on those settings and it'll show you on a map exactly where the perimeter is. Now there may be some small margin of error on here. So if your neighbor's house is right here, I mean, don't cut it that close, give yourself a little buffer, but it shows you the flight envelope on the map. So always remember that it's easy to see it, at least the perimeter, then you can't see where the height is. There's no way to see what that maximum altitude is, but just seeing that perimeter on a map is incredibly helpful and it'll keep you from losing and crashing your drone. So now let's talk about beginner mode and what I call super beginner mode. So in beginner mode, the app, if you click on the settings in the app, it's gonna to default to beginner mode and it's gonna default the flight distance 30 meters and the altitude 30 meters. That's called beginner mode. The default speed, which is our third dimension in the flight envelope, defaults to medium. Every time you turn your controller on, your speed defaults to medium. So, the, so they're basically saying, if you're a beginner, here's what I think is really good for you. 30 meters of distance in any direction, 30 meters high at medium speed. If you're a beginner, wouldn't it make sense to fly a smaller distance, a lower altitude and a slower speed? It would. So I call this super beginner mode. If you're a beginner, don't rely on what the app is telling you as beginner, turn that thing off. And you can just go into the settings screen, set your flight distance at the minimum, which is 20 meters instead of 30. So that's gonna make my circle smaller here. So I'm going from 30 to 20 with a smaller circle. And I can set my altitude from 30 meters to 10 meters. So instead of being essentially up here, I'm gonna fly it basically down here. So I've just reduced my flight envelope in terms of my perimeter 
plus I'm flying at a slower speed. Instead of whipping around at medium speed, just fly at a slow speed for God's sake. Why wouldn't a beginner fly slow? So set your speed to slow, maximum distance 20, maximum height 10 meters. That's as low as you can go. So now let's look at this chart and what this does is it compares the recommended, and this is exactly to scale, the recommended beginner mode to what I'm calling super beginner mode. Super beginner mode is one fifth the space that you're flying in and you're flying at a lower speed. Why wouldn't you do that if you're a beginner? I mean, that's super beginner mode. Set everything at the minimum. It keeps the drone close to you, it keeps it low to the ground, and it keeps it flying slowly. Just do that super beginner mode until you master it, then step it up, step it up, step it up. Go from 20 to 25, 25 to 30, 10 to 15, 15 to 20. Gradually work your way up to what the app calls beginner mode, which to me, I call that I crashed my drone six times in six days mode. I was flying in beginner mode. I could not control this thing. So now you're thinking, when is this guy actually gonna fly the drone? We're getting there. So now I'm gonna show you how to power this up because the most important ways to control your flying so you don't crash your drone, number one, control your flight envelope that we talked about in the prior section. Number two, set up and calibrate your drone properly. If you do those two things well and do it every time, the drone practically will fly itself. The reason people lose and crash their drones is because they skip these steps right here or their flight envelope is too big. Here we go. This is a three-step process. I call this the three C's. First, we're gonna connect all the components wirelessly. Second, we're gonna calibrate the drone. And third, we're gonna do a controlled hover. If you do these three things every time you get ready to fly the drone, you will massively reduce your risk of crashing and losing your drone. Let's power up the drone. First thing we need is our battery. When your battery is fully charged, that charger is going to show a solid light. This is fully charged. I put the upside up. I snap it in. So I got power. I click the on off button here on the bottom. And I get these lights turning on. Now, it's very difficult to see these lights when you're outside in daylight. So I'm not going to give a lot of the instructions in terms of what the lights are doing because there are other ways to tell the status of the drone. But, well, and I'm also colorblind, so I can't tell if this is pink or red or purple or blue. So the manual describes how to read the lights. I'm not going to go through that because I don't rely on that because I can't see the colors. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to power up the drone. I hit the power button on the bottom. Next, I have to connect the drone to Wi-Fi. You have to do this every time. And when it says you need to connect to Wi-Fi, you're basically connecting your phone to the drone using the Wi-Fi receiver in your phone and your drone. You're not connecting to your home router. You don't need to have, a, have public access Wi-Fi to fly the drone. It's very confusing when they say connect to Wi-Fi because people think that you need to connect to a Wi-Fi network. You're just using the Wi-Fi radio transmitter between the phone and the drone. So I pull that up in my settings on my phone like you're connecting to internet Wi-Fi. I click on Holy Stone FPV and then a series of numbers and letters after that. And then that tells me that I'm connected on my settings, but I can't see there's nothing changed here on the drone since I did that. I can't tell if Wi-Fi is connected. The way that I tell Wi-Fi is connected is I now start up the app, the Holy Stone GPS version one app. And on the home screen of the app, I'm gonna see firmware. That's the firmware in the drone, V3.8.7 underscore three zero. That'll change over time. But when you see that firmware, indicator that means the tr the phone is talking to the drone otherwise it wouldn't know what the firmware is because the firmware only resides on the drone not on the phone you'd think that they would have made something that says like congratulations wi-fi connected or your drone is connected to your phone now there is another way to tell if you have wi-fi connection and that's to see if you're getting a live camera feed when you click on that controls button and it gives you the first person view image on the screen on your phone that's where that mountain range picture will disappear 
you'll see the live feed from the camera, you know you have Wi-Fi. The main reason for having the Wi-Fi connection between the drone and the phone is to send the camera image to the phone so you can use that for the first person view for flying the drone. Now it's important though to make sure that it's actually a live image because when you lose the Wi-Fi connection, you'll get a frozen image on the screen. It kind of fakes you out. So if you're testing to see if you have Wi-Fi connection and a live feed, put your hand in front of the camera to make sure that it's still live and it's not a frozen image. Moving on. So now I've connected phone to drone. Now I need to connect the controller to the drone. The way that I do this, pull up my antennae, lift this up. I'm going to click the power button here, power this up. And you see the camera just moved up and down. It cycled up and down. That indicates to me that the controller is talking to the drone, but there's another step you have to do called pairing, which means I move the left joystick up and down. And there you can see the colors of the lights did change and now they're solid. So I just said, I'm not going to focus on the colors. What I focused on was the camera did a little when I do that up down motion with the left joystick, that means that it's paired. So now I've paired the controller to the drone. The phone talks to the drone, controller talks to the drone. Moving on. Now that we completed our connect step, we're on to the second of the three C's, which is calibrate. This is one of the most critically important things that you need to do with your drone as a proper calibration. Calibration is what helps the drone figure out what level is. If it doesn't know what level is, you're going to get your drone doing this. This calibration step really helps keep this on axis and do a controlled hover, which is our next step. But in calibration, we're going to do a three step calibration, horizontal compass calibration, vertical compass calibration, and a level gyroscope calibration. You have to do all three of these and do them well to get this to work. You also need to do this step every time you change the battery, every time you power up the drone, when you connect for the first time. I do this pretty frequently to make sure that I always have a good calibration because that reduces my risk of my drone flying away or crashing. The way that you initiate the calibration is you push the joysticks up and in. That's two o'clock position on the left, 10 o'clock position on the right. You push these up and in, and it shows you this little image of the spinning drone on the app. You're gonna follow those instructions. It says to spin the drone clockwise and counterclockwise in a level manner. If you're on a level surface, you can just do it like this. If you're outside in the grass, you might wanna pick it up and make sure that you're really holding it level. You do that for about five seconds until the screen moves to the next step. Now the screen flipped to the vertical step. So what I do now is I pick the drone up with the camera pointed down and I want to carefully turn it on axis clockwise and counterclockwise, keeping that vertical axis. That's going to give it verticality. And then my screen tells me that I can set it down, that it's got a vertical calibration. There it is. I set that down. Now the last step in the process, this is critically important. My screen went blank. It looks like I'm done, but I'm not done. There's another step in the process. This is really peculiar the way they did this user interface because it prompts you for the first two steps in the calibration, it doesn't prompt you for the third one. The third one is the gyroscope level calibration, which is incredibly important, but the only way to initiate that is through another joystick control. Now I'm gonna push the joysticks up and out. That's 10 o'clock on the left, two o'clock on the right, up and out. Lo and behold, there's another calibration step. Look at that on the screen. What it tells me to do is put the, the drone on a level surface. It's already on a level surface, so I don't need to move it anywhere. But if you're outside, you want to really make sure this is level for this last step. If you're sitting it in the grass or something like that, really make sure it's level. The compass will calibrate to level and then you're finally done. A lot of people erroneously mix, miss or skip this third step because it doesn't prompt you to do that. I've even seen pro demonstrations on YouTube where they, you, you watch them do the calibration and they skip the gyroscope level step. And then the drone starts toilet bowling and they're like, wow, this product's not very good because it can't keep level. They skip the level step in the calibration. It's on the video. Now, another way to remind you if you skip that last calibration step is when you get ready to fly this, the next step should be that we're going to arm the motors. I push this down and in and the motors should turn. 
if you have to do that twice to get the motors to turn on, it usually means that you skipped that last step, the gyroscope level calibration. So that's just a trick that I learned by accident over time. And you'll see people do that on the videos as well. You'll see them try to arm the motors. They don't arm. They arm it again. It arms. That means they skipped the last calibration step. The third step in the three C's is a controlled hover. I need to have a GPS signal. Let's take this out, get it on the takeoff platform, and we're going to do step three. So we've done our connection, our calibration. Now we're on the third C, which is a controlled hover. I'm outside now. The first thing I want to do is make sure I have a GPS signal. I do. I have five bars on GPS. So that's good. I got the drone sitting on the platform with the camera facing away from me. I'm basically going to arm the motors. I pull the joysticks down and in. That's going to start the motors. And then I'm just going to do a auto takeoff and I'm not going to touch the controls. And I want to see if this can do a controlled hover. And there's a little breeze out here today maybe five or six miles an hour. So we're gonna see what happens. I'm just gonna do auto takeoff. I'm gonna set the controls down. That's a perfect controlled hover, exactly what you wanna see. That means that the calibration worked. I got a good GPS signal. If you can't get a controlled hover like that, do not fly the drone, get it down on the ground recalibrate it again. You want it to look like that before you start flying every time. That's really a perfect controlled hover right there. Now, two things that can happen here is you can get drift. And usually that's because you didn't do calibration properly. If the drone just starts drifting really slowly in one direction, you have to keep pulling it back. There's a process you can do called trimming. I recommend reading the manual for that. It's a little complicated. You have to turn the GPS off completely, and then you use the photo button and the joystick button to basically re-level the drone, but I'm not gonna show that in detail here. But trimming is required when the drone just keeps drifting, drifting, drifting. For me, it's easier just to shut the thing down and recalibrate it, and that usually fixes it. If you have to trim it every time, that means that there's usually some defect. You have a bad propeller or a motor or something like that. The second thing that can go wrong is when you lift off with the auto takeoff and the drone just takes off on its own, that's usually when you have a bad GPS signal and the drone actually thinks it's somewhere other than where it is and it's trying to get somewhere where it's not supposed to be. I'm gonna demonstrate what that looks like because it's gonna scare the crap out of you the first time it happens. Let me show you what it looks like. There it goes. That's a bad scene, man. And you go like this, huh? and then it comes back like this. And you go like this. This is where you're just fighting the GPS. You're fighting, you're fighting the GPS. It's going crazy. When this happens, get that thing on the ground as soon as possible. Just land the thing wherever it is. I'm just going to hit auto land. Boom. What do you do when that happens, when you have that out of control takeoff? Brain transplant. Brain transplant, take out the battery, restart this thing completely, go through that entire calibration process. That'll usually fix it. If you start getting that wild aberration off the takeoff platform, it's very hard to correct for that without just resetting the whole thing. Now let's talk about auto takeoff, auto landing and return to home features. Auto takeoff is easy. You click this button in the upper right hand corner after you've armed the motors, the motors are spinning, you click auto takeoff, it'll just go straight up somewhere between three to five feet and per the manual. I see it tend to sit around three feet or one meter off of the ground. It should hover in place, as I said before, that controlled hover when you do auto takeoff. When you do auto landing, it'll just gradually lower itself to the ground. Now, the thing to remember with auto landing is it doesn't know where it is. It's not gonna fly it back to the landing location. Auto landing just means go straight down and land. So if I'm out over here and I'm out over a pond and I want this to land on the takeoff spot and I hit auto land thinking it's gonna come back, 
it just goes down, 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 boom, into the pond. It just goes straight down. So be careful when you hit auto land. I did this one time over a body of water. Freaked me out because I thought I was telling it to return to home when in fact it just meant take a soft landing wherever you are right now, chief. Now the next feature that we'll talk about is called return to home. This is a really powerful feature. Basically, as you're flying the drone, it can be anywhere out here in your flight envelope. And with the press of a button, you can tell the drone to take control. It'll use the GPS capabilities to fly back over the landing target, reorient itself, and land itself really close to where it took off. Sometimes it'll land right on the takeoff platform, generally within a meter or two of that point. So this is a really powerful tool, but it's also kind of risky because you're giving up control. You're essentially putting the drone in autopilot mode and you're letting the drone fly itself back. So what are the things that can go wrong? One is the drone can't see where it's going. So if there are obstacles in its way, this does not have obstacle avoidance and it could run into those obstacles. The second thing is that the drone uses the return altitude. If you recall from this settings menu where we've put something in here called the return altitude. If you're not careful about how you set that return altitude, for example, if you set it too high, you could bring your, your drone back and it could go up 100 meters, that's 300 feet, before it comes back, which puts it up in high wind territory. A lot of bad things could happen up there. So you got to really know how the return to home functions work to make sure that you're doing this in a controlled manner. I'm going to go through this in detail now. Now, just to make things complicated, the drone operates in two completely different return to home modes, and it depends on how far away the drone is from the takeoff point. Now, this is incredibly frustrating because there's no documentation of this in the manual. I called Holy Stone to customer support. I wrote to them. I asked to speak to a product engineer. There's basically a point programmed in this where the drone realizes it's past a certain, certain threshold and it will operate either in short distance return to home mode, that's mode number one, or long distance return to home mode, that's mode number two. In short distance mode, it's assuming you still pretty much have line of sight to the drone, and when you press return to home, or when it goes into return to home mode for low battery or fail safe, it comes back at current altitude and it lands itself. That's called short distance return to home with no altitude adjustment. You cross over this unknown threshold and all of a sudden the drone starts to operate differently. Now it realizes it's in long distance mode. And when you press return to home, it doesn't fly straight back. It's going to fly up to the altitude that you specified in the settings for return, uh, the return altitude. It's going to fly back to the landing point and then it's going to put itself down. That's in long distance return to, mo return to home mode. Now, like I said, there's no documentation of what that threshold is when it changes between those two modes. So I took this out to a soccer field and I tested this to try to find what's that point where it switches between short distance and long distance operating mode. What I found is that point is at about 30 meters. When the drone crosses that threshold, it behaves completely differently. When it's short of that threshold, it stays at its current altitude and returns to home. When it's past that threshold, it'll rise up to the return altitude in the settings. It'll come back and then drop itself down. Here's a picture to illustrate what I found. So in this picture, you can see in the short distance mode, it's going to come back at current altitude. That altitude might be higher or lower than the altitude that you specified as the return altitude in the settings. It basically just ignores that return altitude completely. In long distance mode, when you cross over that threshold, the drone will ascend to that return altitude and then fly back and put itself down on the landing pad. If the drone is flying higher than that return altitude, it will just come back at that high altitude. It will not descend. So that return altitude is really, you can think of it as the minimum return altitude when you're over that distance threshold. So when I first started testing the drone, I was doing all the tests at short distances. So let me go through and I'll talk about the three types of return to home at short distance, and then I'll come back and tell you how it works at long distances. Now let's talk about 
return to home. There are three different types of return to home, standard return to home, return to home low battery, and return to home fail safe. I'm gonna tell you about these three. Standard return to home, this is a great feature. Basically, you're flying the drone, you're out here at the edge of your envelope, everything's going great, and your wife calls you and says, honey, come in for dinner, I just press the return for home button, return to home, the drone will basically turn around, it'll fly back at altitude over the takeoff point, it'll reorient itself in the original position, camera always facing that way, and it'll lower itself down and land really close to where it took off, usually within one meter or three feet of where it took off if you have a, a nice GPS signal. The only thing to remember is that when it flies back, it's gonna fly very fast and in a straight line. So for example, if you were really testing your drone flying skills and you got a big tree in your yard here, you're like, watch this, watch how I, I fly, go around the tree, goes around this way. I turn my drone around, wife says, honey, come home for dinner. I hit return to home, watch this, straight line, boom, crash and burn. It doesn't know that there's a tree here it only flies in a straight line from its current position, trying to get back to the home base. And if there's some obstacle in its way, it's gonna hit it. This thing doesn't have any kind of obstacle avoidance. The second type of return to home is return to home low power. Now I've tested this. When my drone battery starts to indicate low, you'll see the battery indicator turn red. You'll see a, st a status message that says drone battery low, and you're flying your drone I've just let the battery run down. It's just flying up here like this, and I just put the controls down, put my hands in my pocket, and I just let the battery die. And as the battery starts to get down to zero, drone flies back like this over the landing spot, reorients itself, puts itself down. Again, it'll fly straight line of sight, so if you're down at a low altitude and your battery's low, boom, crash and burn, you don't wanna do that. You gotta have a clear line of sight at altitude to come back and put it down. But I've tested that. It works every time I've tried it. I've probably tried it about five times where I just let the drone onboard battery go to zero. It'll land itself. It's amazing. Now the third type of return to home is called fail-safe return to home. And that's where the drone loses connectivity with your phone and or the controller. So this one's real tricky. I've tried this one as well and it works. So basically, I had the drone flying out here like this, and I just turned the controller off. I just power down the controller, and the drone automatically wakes up, and it's like, something bad's happening here, and it turns itself around, flies over landing space, boom, put itself right down, when it lost that connection with the controller. I haven't tested it to see what happens if you just lose the Wi-Fi connection. I don't believe the Wi-Fi connection is a fail-safe mode indicator that'll bring it back home, So now I'm gonna completely shut off my phone and just fly it through the controller. And then I'm gonna turn off the controller completely as if the controller battery died. And that should be the fail safe return to home mode. So I got the drone sitting out there about 20 feet from the landing pad. I'm just gonna turn off the controller completely. I got nothing attached to that. Phone's off, controller's off. And that brought itself back to within about six feet or two meters of the original takeoff point. My phone was completely shut down and the controller was shut down. That's fail safe mode. Now, as I said earlier in the video, that return to home function works when you're in full GPS mode, the normal default mode. It works when you're in headless mode, it'll fly itself back and land it. 
It does not work if you're in that altitude mode, which I don't recommend. Altitude mode is where you just shut off GPS. That drone has no idea where it is. It has no idea where the landing space is. It's just responding to your fingers on those controllers. You can hit that return to home button all day. Actually, the light will be off and it's just gonna ignore you and sit out here in space. So that's how return to home mode works when you're within short distances of the takeoff, short of that threshold. It operates with no altitude adjustment. It comes back at current altitude. When you go past that threshold is where you get the altitude adjustment. That's what I call the long distance mode. Here's how that works. So when you think about return to home in long distance mode, you need to be thinking about what's the altitude that I want the drone to come back to me at. Very important because a lot of bad things can happen if you don't set this properly. So when you think about return to home in long distance mode, you need to be thinking about three altitudes. One, what's my maximum altitude that I set in my flight envelope? The highest you can go is 100 meters. It's 30 meters in beginner mode. The maximum is 100. Let's assume we're at 100 as our maximum altitude. The second altitude you want to think about is what's the, what's the height of the highest possible obstruction that could be in my path, like a tree or a building. Let's say this tree is 20 meters high. So now when I pick my return altitude, I want it to be somewhere between those two. It has to be lower than the maximum flight altitude, and it has to be higher than the highest possible obstruction that I could come across in my path. So it's got to be less than 100 and higher than 20 in this example. So let's start at the top with that maximum altitude. So if you go back to the settings, our maximum altitude can be 100 meters. The screen says, that the return altitude should be less than the flight altitude. It says should be, it doesn't say it must, and it won't actually stop you. And I've seen people do this in videos. They just slide both of those buttons over to the right and they set the flight altitude and the return altitude at 100 meters at the maximum. So what happens if you set the return altitude at 100 meters? This is what I call the moth effect. So when you're sitting out on your back porch in the summer and you got the light on your porch on, and the moths keep flying up against the light and bouncing off of it. That's what happens if you're gonna set your return altitude at 100 meters and your maximum flight altitude is 100 meters. When you hit return to home, the drone's gonna go up. It's gonna go up, up, up. It's gotta hit 100 meters. It gets to 98, 99, and the GPS will start pushing it down because the GPS is enforcing the flight envelope. So it's like a moth bouncing off of your light on the back porch. The drone may never actually hit 100 meters, which then puts it into the mode where it can fly back to the landing zone. It's just going to keep going up there, and that maximum altitude limit of the flight envelope is going to keep pushing down on it, kind of like opposing magnets when you try to push two magnets together, and your drone battery might die and drop to the ground. So you absolutely do not want to set your return altitude equal to the flight altitude, even though the system will let you do that. I don't know why it lets you do that. So then you go down from there and you say, okay, then what if just to be safe, I set it at 95 meters versus the 100 meter maximum? That's okay and that would work, but a lot of bad things can happen. This is kind of like what I call the Mount Everest death zone. As you climb Mount Everest, every step that you take, your risk of death increases. In that case, it's because your oxygen is depleting. In this case, it's because your battery power is depleting and the likelihood of running into high winds increases as you increase in height. So let's think about what we just did here. I'm sitting over here at 10 meters. I wanna to return to home. I need to avoid a 20 meter object, but I just say, I'm gonna be safe and I'm gonna set my maximum, I'm gonna set my return altitude to 95 meters. So now when you hit return to home, you gotta burn up all that battery power. You gotta go up, up, up. That's almost 300 feet up. 90 meters, that takes a long time to get the drone up there. You're using maximum power to get the drone up there. You're burning up all your battery and the wind picks up as you get higher off the ground. So basically what you did is you said, I wanna to return to home and I wanna take the longest, slowest, most power draining and windiest path before I get safely back on the ground. This is incredibly dangerous, you don't wanna do that. There's no need to take the drone up to 95 meters 
only to bring it back down over here. So what you wanna do when you're thinking about setting your return altitude is you wanna have a safe distance slightly higher than your highest known obstruction anywhere within your, your flight envelope. And when you set that return altitude, you gotta find that Goldilocks zone that's higher than your highest obstruction and, and lower than the maximum ceiling. So in this case, I know that my, my tree is 20 meters high. I could say, I wanna set my return altitude to 25 meters. That gives me a five meter buffer. You could be a little bit safer and say, I wanna set it to 30 meters. That should be plenty. That's a 10 meter buffer. So what happens then, I'm flying over here. I say return to home, I'm in long distance mode. The flight, the, the drone goes up, say 25 meters, clears the top of that tree. I'm not wasting energy. I'm not up in the high wind area. I'm getting back on the ground as quickly as possible. I come in, it reorients itself, puts itself on the ground. So when you're setting your return altitude, you wanna think about the minimum distance required to safely clear the tallest known obstruction in your flight envelope. Don't waste energy and don't risk going up into the high wind territory by setting it close to the maximum altitude. So now you're probably asking, why is this guy spending so much time on this? Why is this so important? Because when I was researching this video, I read about 500 reviews on Amazon and the vast majority of problems that people have with this drone is when they hit return to home. Why is that the case? Because it operates in two completely different modes and it's undocumented what that threshold is, the 30 meter threshold. So think about this for an example. Let's say you're learning to fly your drone in beginner mode. Beginner mode also happens to be at the threshold where everything operates at current altitude. The return altitude is ignored when you're operating in beginner mode. So you're out there flying your drone around for a week, you're operating in beginner mode, everything's good. Then you wanna step out, you wanna push the envelope a little bit. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna now set, instead of a 30 meter maximum distance, I wanna go 35 meters. I'm really gonna push it, but I get kinda of lazy and I just set the flight altitude and the return altitude to 100 meters, for example. So now, I'm flying my drone around. I used to fly 30 meters and press the return to home button and it would always come back. Now, I fly 31 meters away from the takeoff point. I press return to home, my drone launches into the stratosphere. It goes up 100 meters before it comes back. It goes up into high wind territory. I just launched a 220 gram, 7.7 .7 ounce piece of plastic, 300 feet in the air, and it flies away. That's one of the most common things that people say is I was using my drone, I pressed return to home, and my drone just took off and it flew away. That is why, because you didn't realize you crushed that threshold from 30 meters where it comes back at current altitude to 31 meters where it goes up to the maximum that you set for your return altitude. The second thing that happens is people say, I crashed my drone into a tree. This is the opposite example, where I'm not operating in beginner mode, I'm operating at a higher distance, well, let's say I'm operating at 50 meters away from the takeoff point, and I have my return altitude set to 30 meters. So I'm flying out here, I flew around my tree, I've hit return to home because I'm past the 30 meter threshold. It always goes up and over the tree, comes back and lands. That's how I learn how to fly. Then one day, now I'm flying out here. I still go around my tree. I happen to be at 29 meters, 29.9 meters. And now I say, just like before, return to home. It ignores the return altitude, crashes into the tree. Boom, game over. You just lost your drone. This is why these things happen. Return to home operates in two different modes. The 30 meter distance is not documented, so people think their drone is taking on a life of its own, it doesn't follow the rules, I can't control my drone. This is really a critical miss in the documentation about this drone, but if you understand this, it'll reduce your, uh, your likelihood of crashing and losing your drone. So what's the bottom line? You gotta know if you're in short distance mode or long distance mode, and there's no documentation on this, Short distance mode, the drone's gonna come back at current altitude and land itself. It's not gonna do the up and over method. Long distance mode, it's gonna do the up and over. And when you set that return altitude, you gotta find that Goldilocks zone that's higher than your highest obstruction and, and lower than the maximum ceiling with a bias towards being on the lower side so you don't get up in the high wind territory.
Now there are two other advanced features with return to home that are not well described in the manual, but I think I have these figured out. It's when you're in long distance mode, so you're past that 30 meter or 100 foot threshold away from the takeoff point, and you go into low battery mode or fail safe mode. Let me describe what, how each one of these works. If you're past that 30 meter mark and you're in low battery mode, the drone actually has two low battery modes. It's going to have an initial low battery indicator that says if I'm past the 30 meter mark and I'm in that initial low battery mode, I'm going to ascend to the designated return altitude and I'm going to fly to about 30 meters or 100 feet away from the takeoff point. And I'm just going to park there and say, hey chief, do you want to land me? The, the battery is getting low, so it's going to sit there right at that 30 meter, 100 foot threshold and wait for you to do something. If you don't do anything and the drone goes into extreme low battery mode, it's going to do just what it does in short distance mode. It's going to fly back over the takeoff point, automatically reorient itself and land itself. So there's kind of a two step return process if you're in long distance mode and you have low battery. Similarly, when you're in fail safe mode, the same type of thing happens. So let's say I'm in fail safe mode and I'm out here at 100 meters or 300 feet. So I'm in long distance mode, I'm past the 30 meter threshold, and I go into fail safe mode when I lose connectivity with the controller. Not when I lose Wi Fi, but when the controller connection goes off, the drone's out here, it's basically going to ascend to the return altitude, it's going to fly to within that 30 meter threshold, 100 feet of you, and it's gonna park there and wait for the controller to reestablish its connectivity with the drone. If it doesn't reestablish connectivity with the drone, then it's gonna go into that normal short distance fail safe mode, 30 meters away, I can't connect to the controller, flies itself back to the takeoff point, turns itself around and lands it. So again, a two step process for fail safe mode if you're in long distance mode or past that 30 meter threshold. So again, we ask ourselves the question, why do so many people say that the drone takes on a life of its own and flies away and they lose their drone? I just gave you two more examples. So now let's say you're flying your drone out here and you don't even hit return to home. You're just flying your drone, you're 100 meters away, but, but the drone goes to low battery. When it's low battery in long distance mode, it doesn't fly back at current altitude it fly, flies back at return altitude. So now your battery's low, I'm flying at 10 meters, and the low battery indicator says, gotta get back into range. It ascends to the return altitude, which you might set at 100 meters or 120 meters. You have a low battery and you're launching your drone up here into the stratosphere, up into the high wind territory, and your drone could fly away. You didn't do anything. All you did was let the battery start to drain down and then the drone takes on a life of its own. It goes into that return to home sequence and you can see how critically important it is to set that return to home altitude at a relatively low altitude because there are two conditions now, fail safe or low battery, where you launch your drone into the stratosphere without you doing anything. You didn't press any buttons, you didn't do anything differently. You either lost connectivity with the drone, boom, goes off into space, or the battery starts to get low. You might not even see that because it doesn't have an audible indicator. Boom, the drone goes off into space. When I say off into space, it means rise, ascend up to the return altitude, which could be as high as 100 or 120 meters if you, didn't, if you weren't careful about how you set that. And then the last type of landing is called emergency stop. This should be called drop from the sky. If you hold down the auto takeoff and auto land button, it will shut down the motors no matter where this drone is and it will drop like a stone to the ground. That's called emergency stop. When do you wanna use that? If you're flying towards a group of people and you can't control the drone, shut that thing down before you cause an accident. 
hit emergency stop, sacrifice the drone, get it on the ground. If you're like in a situation where you just cannot control the drone, I've had this happen before, it's taken on a life of its own. I don't know if it's got a bad GPS signal or what. I can barely control the thing. I get it close to the ground and I just hit that emergency stop, boom, crash it down to the ground. It's the only way. Try to do it over a soft landing spot like a grassy field or something like that. When you got to get that thing on the ground, you just got to do it sometimes. It's important to keep that in the back of your mind because these are those emergency situations where you just got to bail out and you got to ditch the thing. Hit that emergency stop. I hope you never have to do it, but I'm telling you, I've done it a few times in the first couple of weeks that I owned the drone. So now I'm going to do a speed test. There's no documentation in the user manual to say what the slow, medium, and fast settings are, so I'm going to figure it out here just by doing it. I got kind of a small space to work with, so I'm going to fly this as fast as possible straight down through my yard. I'm going to fly right at that giant tree. And I'm also going to test the envelope setting because I'm going to set it for 20 meters. I know that that's further than 20 meters away. And I'm going to fly this thing as fast as I can right at that tree because I know it's going to hit that invisible force field and it won't hit the tree. Or at least we're going to test that out. We'll see how confident I am in the flight envelope concept. So I have my 20 meter setting. I just went into the settings and did that just to double check. I'm going to look at the map on tap fly. I'm going to zoom in on that because I can see the street on the map. So here on the tap fly map, I can see my envelope. That's that red circle. And I can tell from where that is in my yard, I have a safe buffer between here and the street basically, which I can see on the map. And I'm estimating where that tree is relative to the street. I think I'm good. I'm gonna go on slow speed first, just not to do anything crazy here. So I'm gonna arm the motors. I put the speed setting on slow, get a safe controlled hover here. That's a good hover. I'm gonna fly this as fast and straight as I can right at that tree. Now you probably won't be able to see the drone when it gets down there. So I'm actually gonna do a recording of this as well. And you're gonna see it fly right towards that tree. And as it hits that 20 meter invisible barrier from the envelope, you're gonna see the head pull up and it's gonna pull itself back. Here we go. Camera is rolling. Drone is in slow speed test. flying right for that tree yeah you know, there you see it hit the hit the wall pulled itself back try again hit the invisible force field pulled itself back I can't hit that tree even if I wanted to let's return to home <clears throat> now that thing comes in hot even though I have it set on slow, when you do return to home or any of those automated settings, it goes back to medium or fast. So at slow speed, that was flying at about 1.8 meters per second. Let's go up to medium. Hit the wall. So our speed at medium speed is about four meters per second. So now we're at the point where I've shared with you everything I think you need to safely take your drone out and learn how to fly it. You need to do this yourself. You can't learn how to play the piano by reading books about pianos. You got to get out and do it. Here's what I recommend for a flight training curriculum. First, you want to be able to fly the drone in a square, a circle, and a figure eight with the camera facing forward. Then you want to fly in a square, a circle, and a figure eight with the camera facing you. Then repeat those same steps in headless mode and for all six of those flight plans, you want to be trying different landing maneuvers. You want to try the return to home landing. You want to try auto land. You want to try manual land. And you want to try the emergency land. So if you work through these six flight plans with those four types of landings, you'll have a pretty good feel for how to operate your drone. Now make sure you do that. When my recommendation, 
with the super beginner mode where you're keeping the drone close to you and close to the ground, that'll reduce your risk of losing or crashing your drone. And one last safety precaution is that when you're learning to fly the drone in slow speed, it's very controllable, but when the drone kicks into the automated flight, which is the return to home, for example, or the return to home low power, it's gonna come back at medium or fast speed. So you're gonna get used to the drone kind of flying around like this, and then you're gonna let the battery run down, and you're gonna test whether I said was true that if the battery runs out, it's gonna to return to home. You're over here kind of hovering at a safe speed. When that thing kicks into low battery mode, that drone's gonna put its head down, and it's gonna come whizzing back into that landing pad really quickly. And if you're standing too close to it, you know, you gotta keep a safe perimeter around this landing pad because the GPS will only get it so close. You know, the government developed the GPS for a military specification so they could fly guided missiles through a kitchen window and land it on a terrorist kitchen table, but it doesn't work that accurately for commercial purposes. So the drone might land itself three feet, six feet, 10 feet around the perimeter of the landing zone. And when it's in automated return to home mode, it's gonna come in hot. So be careful and stay out of the way. If you don't think I'm serious, here's a little video to prove it. I was flying this drone at a very safe distance, had it under control, but the battery was low and I wasn't paying attention. I was recording a video and this thing kicked into low battery return to home and it came in hot and I was standing really close to the landing pad. So at medium speed, that was flying at about four meters per second. Now you know why I wear a hat and safety glasses. Now let's talk about how photos and videos are stored. This is an incredibly confusing topic and it really shouldn't be, but there's a lot of misinformation out there. The manual is incredibly confusing in its description. It just omits a lot of details. So I'm actually not getting a lot of use out of that. But I did a number of tests on this where I took multiple photos and videos using different buttons. I compared the file sizes, the resolution sizes on the phone, on the SD card, on the drone. I got this figured out and a lot of people are gonna argue with me in the comments and tell me that I'm wrong. But I would suggest if you do all the tests that I do, I would be very, very surprised if you can prove me wrong by what I'm gonna say here now. And it's different than what 90% of people will tell you. It's different than what the manual says. And it's different than what a lot of the Q&A uh, answers will say, either on the Holy Stone website, on the Amazon website, or on other people's videos. Here's the real deal about how it works. So let me explain to you the results of these tests that I did. Let's talk about photos first. So when you click the photo button on the controller or click the photo button on the app, it does the exact same thing. Some people will say, if you click it on the app, it takes a picture and stores it on your phone. If you click it on the controller, it stores it on the drone. That is incorrect. They both do exactly the same thing. You click the button in either place, it takes a photo, it stores one copy of it on the SD card on the drone, it stores another copy on your phone. Those two copies are exactly the same resolution. 2048 by 1152 pixels, 96 DPI. It stores it in two different file names. It stores two separate files, one on the phone, one on the drone. And the, the drone file is actually a smaller size file than what gets stored on your phone, which I can't explain in any way because it's the same resolution, same DPI. But for some reason, the one that's stored on your phone is a larger size file and it may have slightly better color. I can't explain this in any way, but I'm telling you what happens here. The resolution is theoretically exactly the same, stores two copies of it. I like the look of the phone one a little bit better. It might just be the format that my iPhone is using to store that file, I cannot be sure. With videos, this is a whole different story. So photos is pretty straightforward, videos very different. When you click the video button on the controller, you're gonna hear that beep, beep, beep as it's recording. That does the exact same thing as when you hit the video button on the app without the beep. It, it runs the exact same process. It takes a video from the drone camera. It stores one copy of the video on the drone. It stores another copy of it on your phone. However, the drone copy of the video is much higher resolution than the copy of the file that's on your phone. 
if you bought this drone looking at videos on the website and on the advertisements and you're wondering why isn't my video as clear as that you're probably looking at this copy of the video that's on your phone there's another copy on the sd card on the drone it never ends up on your phone ever it's always on the sd card that is a higher resolution video the resolution of the video stored on the phone is a low resolution video 1280 by 720 that's an mp4 file stored on the phone the resolution of the video stored on the drone is much higher resolution 2048 by 1152 that's an avi format file it stores two completely different files one low res video on the phone one high res video on the drone the only way to get this video off the drone is to take out the sd card it's the only way you would think it's connected through wi-fi isn't there some way i can get this thing on the phone doesn't work got to take this chip out put it in a reader now you can copy that onto a computer or you could copy it onto your phone i have a little sd card reader that plugs into my phone so i can eventually get all my videos from the drone onto my phone but i have to manually copy the file it's the only way it happens a few other peculiarities about the the photo and video buttons is that if you're taking a video you can click the photo button and it'll make it sound like it's taking a photo it'll do that beep 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 you'll hear it click sounds like the shutter's going off it's not taking any photos if you're taking video you can't take photos at the same time some you know video cameras will allow you to do that so people think that they're taking still photos you can't you can either take video or still photos never both at the same time the second thing is this microphone setting in the app turns on the microphone and it records on your phone when you're recording video and it only stores that the audio on the version of the video that's on your phone when you click the microphone button there's no microphone on the drone there's never any audio on the high resolution videos that are on the drone ever it's impossible to have audio on that you click that microphone button you get audio on the low resolution copy on your phone lastly i tested this if the sd card is full on the drone this won't tell you in any way shape or form this thing will keep beeping it'll say recording on the status bar on the app and it and the card's full it's not recording it tells you it's recording sounds like it's recording looks like it's recording so you got to check your sd card from time to time make sure you have enough space on there because it won't tell you when it's full Now let's talk about gesture control. Now this is a feature at the beginning of the video where I said I wasn't sure if it worked on this model because I couldn't get it to work. I actually did get the gesture control to work, but only in a highly controlled environment. So I actually got this to work a few times by setting this up in my house with the drone actually in a stationary position. It says it should work between three and five meters away. I couldn't get it to work at that distance. I had to move up about two meters away, about six feet I got it to work. The idea behind this is you press that little hand indicator on the screen and then if you hold your hand up like this it'll take a photo if you hold your hand up like this it'll start a video i did get it to work a few times we you hold your hand up like this in the peace sign it does a three second countdown it takes a still photo you wave your hand in front of it with a big open palm like this it gives a three second countdown and it starts the video what i found is it only works if you have high contrast between your hand and something behind it so if I'm waving my hand over here, it couldn't really see the difference between my hand and what's behind it. But if I hold it in front of something like my black shirt, that's how I got it to work. So you need a high contrast behind it. In general, this feature just doesn't work very well. It's kind of a gimmicky feature. It's super intermittent in the way that it works. I could not get it to work consistently, and I couldn't get it to work at all outside with the drone actually in flight. So. If you were thinking of buying this drone because of gesture control, I wouldn't recommend it. If you were thinking of buying a drone that has kind of a gimmicky feature that works intermittently and not very well, then I would still recommend buying this drone. Now let's talk about follow me mode. There are two follow me modes. The way that you get to these is through the app. There's no way to get to them on the controller. You got to click on this little picture of the running man up on the upper left of the, of the app. That opens up two little sub icons one is a man with wind coming off of his back 
and the other one is a man in a little box. The man with the wind coming off of his back is called standard follow me mode. The way that works is the drone basically, you wanna take it off, you wanna get it oriented up here, and then when you say follow me, let's say I have the camera on myself, it's basically, it's gonna maintain equal distance and it's just gonna keep moving back away from you, moving towards you as you're moving around, the drone's gonna follow you around like this. It's based on distance, but the thing that you need to remember, and of course this is not in this wonderful user manual that I'm gonna use for kindling in my fireplace when I'm done with this, is that you are still subject to the constraints of the flight envelope that you put in the settings. So now you're trying to do follow me, you're walking around your yard, you're going back, everything's fine, you're going forward, you're up here, all of a sudden, drone starts going crazy, you're overcorrect and you're like, what the heck's happening? I'm trying to do a selfie here because the drone hit the perimeter of the invisible force field and it's trying to stay away from you equidistant and it can't do it anymore because you're up against an invisible field. You start going back this way, everything's copacetic, you're outside the force field now, it doesn't care. You get over here, oh, it's going crazy again. You're like, what's happening to my selfie? I can't control the camera because it's hitting the force field again. So you have to remember that even in follow me mode, the parameters that you put in the settings for the flight envelope still apply. You can go outside of the envelope, but the drone cannot. And then the last thing to remember when you're in the standard follow me mode, and this is according to this wonderful user manual, so I'm not sure whether I trust it or not, but it basically says that in follow me mode, the drone is actually following your phone. It's not following the controller and it's not following you. So that's pretty cool because what that means is I can get the drone up in the air, I can hand my phone to my wife and my wife can ride her bicycle up and down the driveway and the drone will follow her because it's following my phone. It's not following me, it's not following the controller. That's theoretically how it works. I haven't tested that out yet. Now I just tested the follow me mode again and I confirmed that the, the drone actually follows your phone, not the controls. I actually set the controls down and walked around with my phone and the drone will actually keep equal distance from your phone. It doesn't care where the controls are, which is kind of interesting because then you could give somebody your phone, you can still control the drone with the controls and it'll follow them because it's following your phone around. But the other thing I found is that even though it's following me at an equal distance, it's not necessarily keeping the camera on me. So you do need to use the joysticks and the camera tilt and gimbal to control the camera pointing at the object that you're following in normal follow me mode. Now let's talk about the other follow me mode that's called lock follow me. This one's pretty easy. You basically get the drone up, you point the camera on the object that you want the drone to follow like yourself. Then you go into the app, you click on the button of the little man in the box and it'll pull up the camera and you just draw a box around the object that you want the drone camera to follow. So I draw a box around this guy and then it'll lock in and it'll, you'll tell it to start. And then as that object moves, the drone will hover in place. The drone will not move. It'll just stay where it is. All it does is it moves the orientation of the camera around as you move around. That's a pretty cool feature. You don't have to worry about the drone hitting the edge of the flight envelope because it's not flying anywhere. It's staying stationary. But also remember that when you go back, the drone's not following you in terms of distance here. It's just staying where it is. And when you go forward, you might be under the camera up here. It's gonna try to stay on you as best it can, but it's not gonna back up. So you gotta watch it on the screen and make sure that you're staying within view. The next feature is called Tap Fly. Tap Fly is a pretty cool feature where you tap on a map and tell the drone where you want it to fly to. There are two ways to do this, single point and multi-point. Single point tap fly, you click on the map icon on the app, open the map up to full size, click the center button, it'll zoom in on your current location, and you'll see that red ring, that's basically your flight envelope as controlled by the settings. So if the point you wanna to fly to isn't inside the flight envelope, that circle, go to the settings and expand it from 30 meters to 40 meters, for example. So tap fly, when you use this, you're gonna pick one point on the map. This will be the single version. Click that point, and then you need to take off the drone, get it up off of the ground. It won't do an automatic takeoff. You get it up off of the ground, then say send, and it'll send that GPS location to the drone. It will fly in a straight line 
at current altitude. If there's a tree in the way, it's gonna hit the tree. So you have to make sure that you can get there in a straight line. It'll fly to that point and it'll stop. Then you can click return to home. The drone will turn around at the same altitude, fly back in a straight line, reorient itself to the way it took off and land itself. That's single point tap fly. Multi-point tap fly is just like it sounds like. You open up the map and you can click multiple waypoints on the map. So for example, if I wanted to fly my drone from this takeoff point and I wanted to look at my neighbor's dog over here, for example, that's the dog, I can't fly in a straight line, so I'm gonna fly in a, in a two, what's called two waypoints. First, I'm gonna click on the map to go over here, then I'm gonna click on the map to go over there, and it'll start to number those waypoints as you click multiple. If you make a mistake, you click delete single, and that's like the undo button, it'll go back one. So let's do a two point tap fly, where I basically wanna go around the tree, over to the doghouse, I take off the drone, I hit send, boom, one, two, it'll stop here and wait for its instructions. But now you can see if I hit return to home, it doesn't return on the same path. It only goes in one direction. When you say return to home, boom, straight line, I crash into the tree, game over. So if you're at this point, just remember it doesn't reverse its course. It just stops and says, Tap fly mission is over. What do you want me to do next? It forgot everything that it did to get to that point. So tap fly is a great tool, but it's gonna fly at line of sight, at current altitude without obstacle avoidance. Just remember that. So the reason I bought this drone was because I live on a cliff and I wanted to be able to fly the drone out to take some photos and videos of my cliff edge to see if there's any evidence of erosion but I was really leery about flying out over open water until I got this thing under control. If you follow the steps that I followed here, if you understand everything that I've explained here, you should feel comfortable doing what I'm gonna do right now. I'm gonna fly this out over open water. I'm gonna take some photos and videos and bring it back in for landing. Thanks for watching my video. Good luck with your drone. Don't screw it up.